الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين رحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم محمد وأهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله روحي وارواح العالمين لك الفداء يا غريب يا مظلوم يا شهيد بأرض كربلاء السلام عليكم يا أهل الرزاء الحسيني مظلوم جميع ورحمة الله وبركاته أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتاب الحكيم وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأقم وجهك للدين حنيفة فطرة الله التي فطر الناس عليها لا تبديل لخلق الله ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون صلاة سورة الروم is remarkable in many ways if you read it carefully. Each verse has a specific universal dimension as much as a particular application. When I say universal dimension means any human being reading that surah would connect to the contents of the surah very readily as a human person. You remember that our search has been from the very beginning to understand human nature in the context of science and religion. I think we have tried to do that. I don't, I, I do submit that we haven't done justice to all the um, different aspects of it. But I think my attempt has been um, to make sure that we do realize a universal dimension in our search for the human identity as a citizen of this world and also human being as a member of a religious, ethnic, regional community. There's no contradiction in this universal identity and specific identity of human beings. I think the reason is that although we do recognize the diversity in human beings, diversity in the cultures, diversity in our beliefs, in other words, we are talking about pluralism at all levels of human existence. And yet, I think Alama Tabatabai is right there. Is, he says, فَلِلْ إِنْسَانِيَ سُنَّةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ فَابِدَةٌ بِسْبَاتِ أَسَاسِهَا الَّذِي هُوَ الْإِنْسَانِ Despite all the differences, what we know about human beings is, that there is something common among all human beings that connects them and relates them to one another and that's their fact of being human being. So whatever we do in our own identities, separate each other from one of one, the other, one of the other, you know, we have our names, we have our addresses, everything is distinct for us individually. 
we still are connected at the level of humanity. وهي التي تدير الرحلة الإنسانية مع ما يلحق بها من سنن الجزئية. Sunan in Juz'iyya is the particularity of each tradition. Although there is particular tradition that connects us to it, there is something common that you and I are looking at, and that's our very being as a human being. Until now, we have been critically evaluating the modern materialistic, monistic understanding of human being. And we have somehow, you know, tried to convey to you that it is not fully satisfactory. I don't mean to say that we have no connection with material. We are connected to the material being. We do need to take care of the material world in which we, we exist. We can't deny our matter. You and I are created in such a way that our creation itself is always reminding us that we have connection with this earth, the very source of the matter. <laughs> At the same time, however, what we have been able to really identify is We need to develop a way of thinking. We need to develop a paradigm for us which can function as an alternative paradigm, not rejecting the secular paradigm because it does speak to us as human beings. Our secularity is well established. We are human beings connected in the larger social organization which sees very carefully that our identity as citizens of this country, for example, is far more permanent and natural, so to speak, because we are born, we are connected with this particular land. I don't think there's a problem in accepting that. But it's not fully, does not fully account for the model that you and I are looking for. The model that you and I are looking for has to deal with the development of human beings in such a way so that we can balance an emphasis, listen to this carefully, we can balance an emphasis on human creativity. We are constantly searching for something new. We have been endowed with something that would always be pleased to find something new. We want something fresh. This is part of our nature. But we also want this creativity with the respect and regard for some notion of tradition. We don't want to throw tradition out. Uh, are you with me? What I'm suggesting, because secularity says we don't need any tradition. We are the creatures of the new tradition, which is modernism. What I'm saying is that we are in the age of postmodernism. That modernism is gone. The one that created us, the one that created the modern civilization, is passé. It's already gone. You and I now are connecting to postmodernity. In a way, postmodernity is a critique of modernity. It's not satisfied with what modernity has achieved in terms of our human nature, in terms of our human connection, and therefore we are looking for something far more valuable. What we need is, listen to this, we need a sense of community in the world, which we don't have. There's no sense of community in the world. Because we don't have a common vision that unites us. Alama Tabatambai is insisting, on the basis of the words that I read, he says we have a common identity. 
We have a common essence in all of us. And that essentially is our humanness. The more we realize that we are human beings first, then it helps us to connect with other human communities around us. But we still don't have a common vision. <coughs> what you and I are witnessing is not the clash of civilization. There's no clash of civilization. Islamic civilization is not the antithesis of Western civilization. If we believe some of the French scholars, then they have said in philosophy quite clearly that when a Western man looks himself in the mirror, he finds Islam there. The rationality, individuality, the connection with the matter, the connection with this world, because Islam is not a whole denying religion like Christianity is. Christianity says very clearly, you will not be able to enter paradise if you are connected with the matter. This is a blow, by the way, to the Western civilization, whereby Christian civilization has to somehow separate itself from the secular civilization. It has led to secularization of Christianity rather than Christianity saying that I will control you and remodel you according to what I think is valuable and essential. Religion is not given that kind of decisive role. The Prophet ﷺ came not only as a founder of a new religion, but he also came as a founder of new Political society. <coughs> Political society, I didn't say state. He laid the foundation of a civilization. The only prophet who did it, by the way. Nabi Musa did it. But the community of Nabi Musa did not succeed in creating the empire that was needed, the forces that were needed to sustain that vision. Islamic tradition or the way the Prophet taught the religion, it was so comprehensive. We call it Al-Namudaj al murakkaba complex model, in which human beings was not only a material being, but also a spiritual being, also a moral being, also a thinking being. All these qualities were added to the human being so that the human being would know how to work for its own paradigm. You might say then, we should have been the leading paradigm setting community in the world. Yes, I think at one time, at one time. And I don't want to glorify the past. I'm not, I'm not trying to retrieve the past. I'm not a Wahhabi. I'm not a Salafi. I don't think the past has the full, full model for you and me to emulate. You think if the Khilafah is a model for you, no, it isn't a model for you and me because Khilafah was truly an extension of the tribal system. It was. Arab tribes knew what a Sheikh was. Khalifa became the leader of the new Arab tribe known as Ummah. You and I cannot accept that. So that Islamic model is not going to work. I'm, I'm just suggesting to you that when the Wahhabis or the Salafis tell us, let's go back in the tradition, in the history, so that we can bring back the ideal period now. And they are talking about, by the way, the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab as being the most ideal period. We don't claim that. The followers of Ahlul Bayt are future looking. Because we are waiting for the Imam to come back. Not for the history to move back. Are you with me? We are not waiting to go back to that period of 7th century. Therefore, the 7th century cannot become a context for your and my paradigm today. Are you clear about it? 
the 7th century Arabia, the tribal system, the way it was operating in the time of the Prophet wasallam, cannot be a model for you and me. There was no concept of citizenry. There was a concept of kinship. We were related to one bloodline. So we were Banu Maya, Banu Abbas, Banu Thaqifa, Banu Tamim, Banu Tahama, Banu Hashim. We were all Banu, 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 Banu Israel. Wah, 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 wah. In other words, we were communities connected to the bloodline. Genealogy was important rather than your own personal accomplishment. Keep that in mind. Your fazilat. Your merits were because you were the son of so-and-so, the daughter of so-and-so. This is, by the way, this was part of the Semitic anthropology. If you open the book of Matthew in the New Testament, Matthew begins by connecting Jesus Christ to Nabi Dawud, David, <coughs> David the king, so that he can say that Jesus was from the seed of the kings. When we talk about Bibi Khadija Salamu Alayha, we want to say that she was Karash woman. She was from Quraysh. We are connected, we are still talking about, by the way, a kind of distinction that is based on the bloodline. To read the bloodline, yes, I don't mean to say genetic connection is not important. I don't mean to say that biological parenthood is not important. I don't mean to say that social parenthood is the only one that will work for you and me. We begin to adopt children rather than giving them birth. Because that would be biological parenthood. Well, if you adopt them, that would be social parenthood. We are very kind. We want to, you know, take on the responsibility of socially parenting a child. It can work, but I'm, I'm not proposing any of that. What I'm suggesting is here. In my discussion with Khanume Tabatabai, Khanume Dr. Tabatabai, the daughter-in-law of Imam Khomeini, although we were far apart in our discussion, we came to one point of agreement. That human dignity cannot be cannot be externally imported. It is something internally connected with your very being. The moment I call you human being, you remember, you see the way the language I'm using by the way, my language is inclusive, I don't say man, then we are excluding women. When you say human being, that means it's more, more both men and women. I don't use any you know, word that is not inclusive. I was corrected by Oxford University. My editor was Cynthia Reed. As a woman, she said, you are too sexist in your language. I said, what do you mean? You're saying, well, he, he, and he. Well, what do you mean God is he and human beings are only he? There are also she in this world. And she was right. So I started changing. I started changing the habit of being inclusive in my language. I'm saying that. Hanumitabatabai. And I agreed that not only the language of Karama, not only the language of Karama is inclusive, it's also gender free. It's also race free. It is also ethnic free. Because that's how the Quran says. We have given honor to all children of Adam. That means the Dignity of a woman is no less than the dignity of a man. We are looking for that kind of paradigm, by the way, to come to our to our aid. The world has changed. There is no clash of civilization, by the way. But there is a clash over the mode of civilization. What would inform us about civilization, the mode of civilization? 
We want to define human being differently than the scientists want to do it. Western civilization, which is, by the way, at the moment, the modern civilization is materialistic, monistic civilization. Everything is measured in terms of your material well-being and nothing more than that. That's the only way, by the way. Let's not be negative about it. I think that's the only way to keep the world in check. Otherwise, there'll be too many claims of superiority, you know, inferiority, you know, blaming one another. That's what happens. So one of the ways out is that you somehow say that Christianity is neutral when it comes to human beings. It's not neutral, by the way. Christianity is not neutral. It does see human beings as being saved simply by accepting Jesus Christ as the Savior. There's no other way to save yourself. But the very interesting question that arises in Islam is, and this is what we are somehow, you know, going to discuss some aspects of it tonight. If we follow Darwinian model, survival of the fittest, or survival of the most powerful, or, let me put it very clearly, survival of the, of the one that has the military power and domination. That's what has happened today. If I have the weapons, then I am at the top. And I will control you. I will control your destiny. Because that's what it is. You will be surprised that medical research in this country was dictated by military. Military wanted to find out how to control certain diseases, how to also spread certain diseases in the land of enemy. So it's very interesting that when we discussed neuroscience, by the way, in my first lecture, and when we talked about the ethics of the neuroscience, the major issue today is, in the nuclear science is, whether we are talking about might being right or right being right. If I have the power, then I'm right. However right I might be, I don't have the power. The equation is going to be changed because religions are not satisfied with it. So when the prophet establishes the new kind of membership, we came to this understanding that human dignity is not open to any kind of negotiation. And Hanumat agreed that we are not looking for external qualifications to, de to devile our respect for human dignity. Human dignity is something that God has implanted in all of us individually. Now that's a good start, by the way. That's a good beginning. In that case, then, <coughs> Said Qutb was wrong to say that only Muslims have dignity. Or only Mormons have a dignity. Or we can do that, by the way, exclusionary walls can be built by any community. We can exclude people. If we were to follow the Darwinian model, then we are leading ourselves to imperialism. Survival of the fittest means survival of the one who has the most able nuclear arms in our moments. Who can kill, who can destroy. And today that battle is going on. Why, when the Iraq invasion took place and when the whole question about the weapons of mass destruction was used in order to invade Iraq, there was an uproar among the moral philosophers. Moral philosophers said very clearly that what we are doing is that we are allowing ourselves to determine the power of nuclear armaments. We are not willing to see that there is another power that equates with our power. After all, nuclear power means anybody can throw the missile and something can happen. When Kennedy had to deal with what we call the missile crisis, that was the crisis. If Russia could show America that they can also throw the missiles, that means they are at power with one another, they are equal. And that was not right for American government to say that we are now equal to Russia because they wanted to say that we are superior to them. In other words, if you follow Darwin and Pedro, you know, uh, model, then you lead yourself to imperialism. 
If you follow the modern culture of consumerism, what we say, you know, in you know, in Arabic, masraf gara, left to spend. Have you you heard about the Black Friday this morning? Black Friday. How many people? 132 million people went for shopping this morning to do what? You know, it's amazing what consumerism can do. How it can propel our love of things, our love of God. There's nothing wrong with it. Provide it. Provide it. We think also of the others. In other, in other words, today there is a power. The power is consumerism. That's how we are controlled. That's how our minds are controlled. And you and I wonder how long will this continue? What we are worried about is not capitalism. We are worried about rampant capitalism. Capitalism that destroys values. That doesn't let you be ethical, moral. You are looking at the way the banks were so greedy and the way they made us suffer. It was the banks. Major banks in America and New York. They acted greedily. We do not want a culture in which there is no advancement without foreclosure. We are now being taught, no, foreclosure is better for you. So we are giving up our homes. The banks are taking over. In other words, they encourage us to spend. And now they are telling us, stop spending. Now we will not give you because the banks are under scrutiny. In other words, greed everywhere, greed everywhere. Did you hear about the University of Virginia president being forced to resign in the month of June? No women knew about it. She was a woman president, by the way. And another woman, the rector of the University of Virginia, forced her to resign. It was a conspiracy. We have never heard in the annals of university presidentship that the president is forced to resign. Poor woman, she submitted without asking questions. But then the faculty and everybody rose and they said, what does that mean? This is the most popular president we ever had. This is a woman, Terry Sullivan. I don't know, how can we just let this go? And the uproar created what we call, for the first time, university set into what, we, what I and you would call moral assessment of the act of resignation. It was the first time, as a woman. Whether it was the woman they did not like, or the, the, the president they did not like, well, it was very interesting to note that the underlining cause was greed. Because this president was not able to raise money for the university. This was her second year. A president of the university is expected to raise lots and lots of money, by the way. Millions of dollars. She was just building her team when another woman, Helen Brothers, and she said, well, you know, she's not doing the job. So two or three people get together and say, let her resign. And we get on Sunday, we get the email that she has been forced to resign because she's not able to deliver. Greed. Are you with me? Greed. And this world, greed is dominating moral values. Because morality wanted to at least give her a chance to defend herself, to tell us why she is being, you know, she did not go home and she did not even ask, why are you forcing me to resign? She thought, you know, the board of visitors of University of Virginia, when they say something, it's God's command. It should be obeyed. She did not even ask. When the faculty started uprising, then she was given a chance to defend herself. What I'm suggesting, by the way, on the university building, on the main building of the University of Virginia, which is the rotunda, which was built by Mr. Jefferson, the third president of the United States, there was a word, greed, 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 greed on each pillar. The four pillars of University of Virginia showed nothing but greed. Are you forgetting what Chevron did, what Evron did? In other words, we are caught up in the consumerist culture which does not recognize any ethical boundaries, any ethical limits on it. 
They can cheat. They can tell you anything. And then they come back to you. It's time for foreclosure. Just give your property back to us. They encourage you to go for half a million property when you don't even have an affording, you know, capacity for 200,000. They give you, they give you money, by the way. Before 2008, the money was easily available to those who wanted loans from the bank. What I'm saying is that we do not want a rampant capitalism in this new model. My question to you tonight, this is the 10th night of Marvin, by the way. It's the night of revolution. Yes, it's the 10th night of the history. But we need to understand an alternative vision where human beings are essential. Not consumerism. Not technical know-how. Not technology. But human beings. The way human beings connect with one another. So I'm asking this question then, can we embark upon the modern era and rid ourselves of the monotony of a traditional society. I'm critical of ourselves too. You have been doing this, you know, following the tradition all the time. It's monotonous. Not only in that, we are also repeating things. We say the same things year after year. You know, the Muslims are not supposed to be this way. What does the tradition say? Ashura night, you don't talk about the world or discuss anything. But the Messiah will say the show. That's how the tradition says. Ashura night means you do not do anything but you weep for him sake. That's the paradigm that we have. We and I are sitting there as lovers of Imam Sayyidina. We love our family. If we didn't love him, we wouldn't come in all this number tonight. We would not. But we also want to ask, what would give us a sense of integrity in our own personality? <coughs> what would give us honest assessment of our own personality in such a way that we will not lose our integrity? Sharafat, Sadaqat. What will make us human beings and human members of the global community? How will we create a global community if you, know, if you and I do not know how to behave decently towards one another? You think it's possible? The question is very tough. We are then looking for humanism. Because our traditional paradigm is very limiting. If you and I want to be successful in, in influencing the world, that you and I will have to come up with a universal language in our paradigm. We'll have to treat other human beings, regardless of their faith and gender, as our equals. We still are worried. If we talk too much about the equality of a man and a woman, we might be trespassing the boundaries of the Sharia. Haven't you heard that? To have this, you know, separation between you and them, although you meet there, but here, it should be there. Otherwise, there will be a lot of talk. Sharia no bhang kare We are not even thinking for a minute how hypocrite we are. For a minute we don't think that. Who are we standing in front of? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only source of Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, our love for the sake of Allah and our anger for the sake of Allah, then you and I would have a better way of explaining ourselves. We are not explaining ourselves clearly. We are hypocrites. We are afraid of what people will talk about us rather than saying what God will think about us. 
See the difference? What does God think about me? God knows me from God to the Lord. Everything from me. Nothing is hidden from him. Who am I hiding from? You? You? I don't understand this new religiosity in the modern times. That's a formalistic religiosity. It simply conveys the formality because we are afraid what others will say, not what God will say, not what Bibi Fatima will say. That's not our concern. I'm 100% sure that's not our concern. Because if that were our concern, then we would not have said something that's insulting to the dignity of a human being, whether it is a man or a woman. You have a problem in hearing the voice of a woman? You men, are you sick? Are you sick? You don't have a you don't have sister, you don't have mother, you don't have wife. You have a problem hearing the voice of a woman, and you are the ones who hear the songs sung by the women. Who are we cheating? When it comes to mercy of Imam Hussein, you and I are worried. How oh, shall we ban take you? So do you. Why reported you so well? But back to Dubai, didn't that just happen? Don't you hear, woman? I, NBC, ABC, I don't know, CBC, all women are talking to us. You know, we should have a panda then. We should have Nikau and Fenders. No, our wives are not my wife. What kind of religiosity is this, my brothers and sisters? Please understand. I'm not against your tradition. I'm not against it. Don't be a boxer in religion. Don't do that. Please don't do that. I don't think Bi Fatima is happy about that. No, no. Don't do that. You must be. Their hearts are sick. When they say such things about men and women. Oh, you think if a woman has a man has a beautiful voice, then a woman is not tempted? What are you talking about? It's on both sides. It's only women's voice that should not be heard. Men's voice? La obai. Not worry about it. Please, if you are going to retrieve the tradition, retrieve it with integrity. This is what I speak about integrity. Where are we? 